uh, in this session, the idea is um, we're going to be covering how to add a solar panel or solar power to um, to a board. In this, I mean, we're going to be focusing on uh, Raspberry Pi Pico, but something similar applies to um, to most other boards or, or microcontroller boards. Um, or even bigger boards just need to basically scale everything, scale the solar panel, scale everything. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna cover first um, how to size a panel, how to find how do you find a panel that works for um, your intended use case. So what are the parameters that you need to to keep in mind? And then we're gonna basically do an example of how would you create a circuit that take solar panel and um, um, is able to power your uh, your board. Again, either Raspberry Pi Pico, which is going to be focusing on today, but any other board really works. So we're going to try and give you like the few tips to be able to do anything um, of any size in the future. All right. So the very first thing is that, uh, so I'm gonna have this <laughs> cheat sheet over here, and then I'm gonna go swap in and out. Um, this, this session is gonna be slightly more technical. There's gonna be some, some numbers. That's basically what we need to understand how, how to si properly size a panel. Um, we like, and I've been through this where I got a panel um, thinking that it would work, but then uh, my circuit won't charge, it won't last us much as I thought it would. Um, so there's a bunch of things that uh, you need you need to take uh, into account. So we're gonna be doing some 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 math. Uh, I'm gonna glance over that. Again, if you're interested in knowing more about the numbers or anything, um, ask the questions and we're, we're gonna cover that. So the very first thing that you need to know when you're gonna be doing solar panel or any energy harvesting application. So the thing is that you need to know what your power requirements are or what your energy requirements. So how much energy or power will your um, circuit consume or your use case consume? So it's kind of like the, the very first thing. Um, in the case of the Raspberry Pi Pico, uh, that information you can get from, um, from the, their data sheet. And this is one example, which is basically kind of like on the higher end. So a kind of like a stress case scenario for the Raspberry Pi Pico. Um, Red Pepper Foundation did a, um, a test and they found that it basically consumes around 80, 80 to 90 milliamps at, at five volts. Um, so for the first, so the very first step of trying to size our panels, we're gonna go with this number uh, for this for this application. If you change the board, uh, you go to a bigger Raspberry Pi board or you go to another one, potentially smaller, uh, these numbers might, might vary. So this is kind of the first thing that you need to, uh, that you need to understand. Now, if we take, um, we're gonna be powering this board um, at 3.3 volts instead of five volts. So, um, we're gonna assume that it's not gonna be the worst case scenario, so not the highest possible power consumption, but some, somewhere in the middle. So we, we take 70 milliamps at 3.3 volts, that gives us um, 230 milliwatts. Now, and this is the very first thing that um, you need to be aware of. And this is where, where many people get tricked. So you go, you find one panel online. This is one example that I found on, um, on DigiKey. And then you say, oh, uh, this is 1.5 volts at 250 milliamps. Um, that's over 300 uh, milliwatts. So you're like, okay, like if I need 230 and I have more than 300, I'm good. Okay, this, this panel is what I need. And this is the, first, the very first mistake. Um, so this number, and, and you'll find this, something like some, something similar to this in basically every panel that you find. It's going to either tell you the milliamps or like the power overall. Um, this is under kind of like the best conditions possible, like full light, um, like a, a very bright source uh, applied directly on top of the panel, like no, um, like no clouds or anything. 
um, and with the best possible circuit optimized for this panel. Um, so once you consider that during the day, you're going to have different, um, like the sun is going to shine differently. So by the evening, it's going to shine less um, and media is going to shine more. You're going to find out very quickly that this doesn't really work. Um, so just to um, to give you guys a little bit more, so how can you make this measurement and figure out what it, like what type of panel do you need? So um, a, by the way, yeah. I'm sorry, I've got a question for you. In your, yeah. with, with your solar panel, are you just using the solar panel to power the circuit directly or is there any uh, storage battery involved? So in the circuit that I'm going to share, uh, that I'm going to show in uh, in a few minutes, there is a battery. So most of the times you do have a some sort of storage of energy. Okay. Um, because again, like during the night, the panel is not going to be producing any energy. Right. So you need some sort of way to storage, uh, to store that all that energy during the day uh, so that the circuit can keep on working during the night. Um, yep. So... Going back to this, so the first thing that you need to figure out is like where are you going to be putting the um, like your panel. Um, so these are a tool. I'm, all these links that I'm that I'm um, sharing now, I'm going to share after the session via email, so you can have all these um, sort of uh, things. So the first first thing that you need to figure out is in the in the area. Uh, where you're going to be putting your panel, how much real, how much sun you realistically can get. Of course, it's going to vary per country, per area. Um, so I'm going to put where I'm based. Um, so I'm going to put this, and then be facing south um, in a vertical surface. So this tool gives you how much energy you can extract from a panel at like very different um, times of the year. So if you change, of course, the city, um, you're going to have different um, like different results, right? And at this point, it's up, it's up to you how you want to handle it. Um, what I usually do is I take the worst case um, which is like one of the months with the less um, power available, which is usually during the winter. Um, not not everywhere because sometimes in summer it rains a lot, so there's clouds all the time. But as a general rule, it's usually during winter. Um, so when I'm, I'm let's take one example here. I'm going to take not the worst case scenario, but one of the worst, January. Um, so what this number gives me is. Uh, it says here, I'm gonna, let me zoom in a little bit. It takes you the power per square meter that you can find on an average day in this month. It's kind of like one of the approximations that you can take. You can go worse than that, right? You can take the worst day in the worst month um, and assuming that um, you can have the worst clouds, but on average, this is some this is a number that it's it's good enough um, in my experience to uh, to size solar panels. Now, this is like Burby, work there with me for a second. This is where uh, we get a little bit crazy with the math. You don't need to understand all the numbers again. Like if you want more information, just drop the comment and I'm gonna cover them more in depth. But just this is basically to show you how this first number that the panel shows you doesn't really work. So. This number is the one that I extracted from the other website that I just shown. During a full day, that's how much power I have per square meter. Um, now, at ten percent efficiency, I'm going to cover efficiency a little bit later. But like panels do not take the full energy that comes out of the sun. Like there's losses there. Um, so panels can get like like the worst panels can be. 15% efficient, 10% efficient, all the way up to way higher than that, depending on the quality of the panel. Um, but then, then also the charging circuitry and everything that you have to power that, to source that, that panel, um, that's also gonna have losses. So kind of like a 
bad scenario, but not the worst, will be 10% efficiency overall. Um, and then we're going to cover how can we increase that number a little bit. So that gives us this area, uh, this power per area uh, available. Now, if we need to run the stack, the exact same um, power required from the Raspberry Pi, just by doing the quick math, it gives us that we need um, an area of 17,000 square millimeters. And if we take a look at the panel that um, we were talking about earlier, which this is the, oops, this is the area of the panel. So 165 by 30, 38. That gives us an area of 6,000 millimeters squared, square millimeters. So we can see that we need 17,000 and we get 6,000. So originally we thought that this panel would work, but in reality it doesn't. Um, we need a lot more surface area if we want to keep running this type of circuitry um, throughout the year, and especially in the during the winter months or during the worst months. Um, so very first, very first thing that you need to know when you're trying to pick powering something from solar, um, find the right panel size. Again, just to recap, first thing, figure out what's your energy consumption, figure out where exactly you're gonna be putting the panel, find um, how much sun roughly is in average during one of the worst months of the year, and then do, um, do the math and get exactly how big of a panel um, you're gonna need. Right, so you're gonna need both two numbers to work. One is the maximum output power. So the maximum output power needs to be higher than what you want, but also the average um, power needs to be higher um, than the one that you need for your application. So do not make this mistake. Find the maximum power and also the, the average one. Um, and it's kind of like the first, very first, um, Thing that you need to that you need to figure out. So I, before I, I want to interject here that yep. uh, at least TEGs, their maximum voltage is is a problem, and I, I don't know I don't have much experience with solar panels, but if you design for one thing, sun comes out one day and it's over voltage, is it you know that's, that's fun. Yeah, definitely, and that's that's why you need, and we're going to talk about that later when we talk about the charging circuitry. Um, and, and that, that goes both ways, right? Some panels, when they're, when they're smaller, have a low voltage. So if you need to power something that high voltage, you need a converter there. And the other way around, when you're using a big panel with a huge voltage, potentially you need to drive that down um, to be able to use it. But yeah, like voltage is something that we're gonna be covering now. But definitely you need that to be adequate for, for the circuit that you're running. So before we get to to next session, um, any other questions? All right, I'll take that as a no. And by the way, I'm not monitoring the chat. So if there's a question there that needs to be answered, um, just feel free to interrupt. Yeah, and feel free to post any questions in the chat. I'm trying to answer any of them live that I get. We're just chatting about some cool project ideas. Um, Edgar's talking about um, creating a, a little device that sits in the mailbox and lets them know when there's mail in it. I also would like that invention because I don't <laughs> like checking my mailbox. <laughs> Especially when there's nothing in it, there's no point in going to it. But anyway. And we're going to be talking about that at the end of the uh, at the end of the session so keep all those nice projects coming because there's uh, there's some news at the end uh, so all right so the first, what we just did was we figured out what the right size of um of the panel would should be for it to cover my uh my use case now i'm going to quickly cover how like how panels work, um, and I'm going to be covering all the voltage that I know just just mentioned, and why do you need a converter circuit usually after um, like after the solar panel? Like you, you're gonna if you look at solar panels for your application, you're gonna find 
uh, that everybody talks about MPPT, MPPT, MPPTs, and why is that? What is that? And do you need one? Um, so when we're talking about solar panels, whoops. Uh, all right. When we're talking about solar panels, like they're kind of like usually like very <laughs> finicky things. And there's, so they're designed to extract power at most of the different um, loads. So if you're trying to extract a specific, um, just to rephrase that, panels work around like across the whole voltage range. So depending on how much is shining, the panel will, of course, give you a certain um, amount of power, right? If there's more sun, the panel will, will be able to give you a lot more power. Um, so you can see that in the different um, graphs here, the curves here. So when there's less sunshine, the power, um, which is the top here, is less than with more sunshine. But also, and this is particular to solar panels, they have a very specific um, voltage current combination that gives them the maximum power. And you give them, you see that because there's like every curve has a top um, point. So only at this power voltage and current, the panel will give you the maximum amount of power that it can, right? For example, let's just for an example. Let's say that um, we have this like maximum sunshine here. And then I'm trying to extract more than 35, um, sorry, more than um, eight um, amps of, of current. The only way that I'm able to do that is at 30 volts, right? If I go over any of that, so below or above, and that goes both ways, right? If I extract less current than I need, or that the panel is, is op optimum at, I'm gonna get less power. Um, so there's only one specific voltage and current um, that gives me the power, the maximum power um, of the solar panel. And since area is usually the limiting factor, we need to make sure that we extract the most out of it. And that goes particular for particularly when we have low um, low sunshine. If we, if we're not extracting the most out of the panel at, at low sunshine. You can quickly get into, for example, at maximum sunshine, you, you're extracting how much is it? Like 250 um, watts in this random example, but all, all panels behave like this. Um, at minimum sunshine, like the very maximum is 50, 50 watts. And then if I'm not on the optimal point right here in the curve, I quickly get down to a lot less, like 25, 20. So, this is the importance of the circuit that goes after the panel. So the circuit that goes after the panel, like the main goal is to keep the load right at the point where the panel is, 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 is um, providing the maximum power. So basically what the MPPT circuit does is it, um, it changes its internal resistance. So basically it extracts the, the amount of current that will give me the optimum power at, at every at every single sunshine. So it, it probes the panel to see how much it's capable of getting and then adequates so that it extracts always the maximum amount of power. Um, and that's where the um, the energy storage comes in, right? If you're, if you're extracting more power than what your circuit needs, you're basically, that same circuit is gonna be charging your battery so that when the sun goes down or sunshine gets less, and then the panel cannot provide the enough power to power your circuit, it's gonna extract that power from the battery. Um, so that's basically why um, MPPTs exist. Now there's cases where you don't need that, right? If space or area is not um, a concern, right? You can put a huge solar panel for a small circuit. You can just basically optimize for one point here. Uh, and you say, okay, I'm gonna always gonna extract um, at this voltage um, and then whatever current, 
that's fine. Um, but in most cases, you need to extract the most. Again, just to recap, if you have enough size so where you don't really care about optimizing um, the panel because you have excess, then you might not need an MPPT. If in most, like in most cases, you do need to optimize the most out of it, um, you will need some sort of um, MPPT circuit. And we're going to cover how to design one in the next um, in the next session. So we're now going to be covering. Um, oops. Okay. Basically, how you do how do you design a um, a circuit that does basically that? So in this case, we're going to be running with like a very small panel. Um, in this case, something around this. So this is you can see here the uh, the hand here is a teeny tiny panel. Um, it can provide 200 milliwatts and maximum of two volts. Now, if you're going to be powering our Raspberry Pi Pico, at least it needs 3.3 um, volts. So we're going to need some way of converting the two point the two volts that the panel can provide to um, the five point uh, the three point three volts that the Raspberry Pico requires. Now, there's many different ways of to, of of doing this, but what I found that usually provides the best result um, is to use a like an IC that kind of does everything at once. Um, I'm I'm using this this case this one in this case uh, is from EPs. Um, they have a bunch of different uh, ICs that are basically energy harvesting from from many different sources. Um, so you can see how that uh, you can extract energy from like photovoltaic, RF, thermal, vibration. Like there's a bunch of different things. I, I like these ones because they're they're really easy to use. Um, and there's one for basically every kind of energy that you might want to work with. Um, again, like. The different application, the different energy sources can provide different amounts of energy. So if you want to extract from radio frequency, it's hard. You need a very, very low power um, use case, but they're there and, and people use them. Okay, so in this case, this circuit basically provides kind of a um, like a full package. So it gives you. Uh, so it. it basically gives you the full uh, the full thing. So it has um, like a regulated output. So it has LDOs for uh, for powering your load. So in this case, the Raspberry Pi uh, Pico. It also has the MPPT. So it's also included in the same package. So if you connect things right, um, the chip itself will take care of finding the right. Um, balance and extracting the most out of the panel. Again, this is usually this is super helpful um, in, the, in these applications where you need to um, extract the most energy and also has a bunch of, uh, so saying, power converters that can cater for different applications. You have um, like a 1.8 to 4.1 volt LDO. Um, you have like a smaller LDO with less current, um, and it's it's quite efficient. I think it's like I haven't seen it, but um, like I haven't tested, but like in you like according to their own um, data, you can get up to ninety five percent efficiency of extracting um, energy from the panel. Apart from the efficiency of the panel itself, which again it can go from 15, 10, 15 percent of the worst panels to um, thirty plus percent. On the, on the best panels out there. Um, but if your extracting circuit is not really efficient, then you're losing a bunch of energy on the panel, you're also losing on your circuit, and then you're gonna need a huge panel to, to power anything. Um, so we're gonna be using this circuit um, and I'm gonna be sizing it to something like, like, like this panel. This will work basically for this, the example that, that you guys sent, where you just need to see if there's mailbox, because for example, in this case, you can only power the device every, whatever, an hour, two hours, three hours for a second, 
check is there male no or yes and then shut down um so in those cases you can get away with like a very low power application a small solar panel uh, because the thing's not going to be on the whole time but only in like very short periods of time that's basically a very good example for the circuit that i'm gonna that i'm gonna show now um okay so before i get to the um schematic and how you design this circuit in, in particular and some of the things that you need to, to keep in mind um to have any questions around um like the why do you need a, the mppt um and why sort of integrated solutions are um usually the best option um we've got one from the chat which is uh, how much efficiency gain can you get by using an MPPT? I took a stab at that, but I figured you might have some more information. Um, sorry, can can you repeat the last uh, bit of, this, of the question? Yeah, it's um, essentially how much efficiency gain will you get from using an MPPT versus not using an MPPT? So would it be maybe like 10% or does it vary throughout the year? So it... It varies uh, from a few things. So it varies um, depending on the the panel itself. Some panels, um, so th there's two ways that the, the MPPT gain efficiency. One is you're guaranteed to always to to get a, the power always at the maximum point. Um, but also when the sunshine changes the MPPT will change that maximum point. So you could fix it here, right? Um, so the first thing is that you need some circuit to fix the voltage and the power here. Um, so not many um, power converters can work with a, um, a set or a fixed input voltage. Most of them will do whatever, like the voltage will vary and they they fix the output voltage. They don't fix own, they don't fix the input voltage. So you need some sort of circuit like that. Um, but assuming you get like if you compare to a circuit like that, um, it depends on the panel. The efficiency that you get will be from around ten percent in kind of like the worst case scenario to up to 20, 25 percent, um, depending on how much this um, this point moves. In this case. It basically moves from. Um, so let's say that I, I said assume that you, you said it on, on this, um, like on this point, right? And it's always going to be drawing at this voltage. At this voltage, you basically lose what, like ten percent, not more than that. Um, but in in any in, in other panels, and specifically um, like the, the the smaller ones when the sunshine gets lower, this point moves a lot more than on the bigger panels. So it changes not depending on the panel, um, but 10% is usually what, um, at least what uh, what you can expect to, to gain just by having an MPPT there. Nice, thanks for the answer. All right, so let's move on and spend a few minutes um, talking about the, the circuit itself. So you can, you can see here that <laughs> basically like this is the whole, um, like the whole circuit. So these type of ICs make things very, very easy. And if you go to, to their website, there's things like this from linear as well there's things from the um like this from ti texas instruments uh they have circuits similar to this one um this is the one that's usually easiest to to, to work with but all these other companies have and again i'm going to share you um links to all these other options um after the session so let me close a few of these things all right, so this is the whole thing that you'll need for a circuit like this. Um, and these type of switches are specifically prepared to work with microcontrollers. I'm gonna sort of quickly show you why. So the very first thing is um, 
so here's the input. So the input comes from um, I call it Sun, but this is basically the like the source of the chip. And this chip has to oh. uh, what what was that? <laughs> We're getting very excited. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um sorry. What was I saying? Uh so Okay, yeah. So what I say is that so this IC allows you to have a few different options for in terms of batteries. Um, so in this case, what I did is I designed one around super super capacitors instead of battery. You can put in this circuit, you can also use a lithium ion battery, like the, the ones on the, on the phones and um and things like that. The cool thing about this one is that you can use super capacitors. Um so and these ones specifically are good for those like bursts of um, of work where you're going to be powering the thing on, consuming a little bit of energy for a few seconds and then shutting down um, because it cannot hold as much energy as a lithium battery can hold. But a few things that are interesting about this about supercapacitors that they're basically soldered on the the board itself, so there's no need to do any um, sort of assembly. But also, this can be shipped uh, by air. Um, so lithium batteries cannot be shipped by air. Uh, supercapacitors can be shipped by air. So if you're, like, this makes a little bit more sense for um, like commercial use cases. But like shipping this. Like super capacitors is much easier than um, than shipping batteries. And again, like in the case of this IC, uh, it's super easy. You just change where here it says bat instead of putting the super capacitor like I did here. Um, you can put a battery, and it just works. You just change one of the config um, one of the config pins um, over here, and the circuit will behave to charge a lithium ion battery instead of supercapacitors. So super flexible. Um, now, a few things that I wanna um, that I wanted to. I've got a I've got a question. What's the purpose of that BAL line? The oh the balloon. Um, is it, how do you say it in English? Is, is it balloon? I always call it balloon, but I'm not sure how you spell that in English. Balance, balance, balance. Or... Yeah, okay. <laughs> uh, B A L U N, like oh, I balance. Yeah, I just realized that I have no idea how to properly pronounce that. But anyways, so the need for this line is if you're charging the two supercapacitors. Uh, let's let's for a second that this is not here. Depending on how they're built, one might be charged a lot more than the other. Um, oh, okay. So it can yeah, basically a, so it, get destroyed. Yeah, so it just balances the charge between the two. Between exactly. The two okay. So the yeah. balloon is, is basically balance and balance. It, what it does is it balances the charge on the two capacitors so that one doesn't explode because it gets overcharged or over discharged. Um, and this, this is built in. If, you, if you're going to be using a like, lithium ion battery, you're not going to need, uh, you're basically not going to use that pin because it's going to be, or if you use just one, Super capacitor, right? If if this is removed, uh, you can just basically connect ground directly there. Yep. And the the balloon is not going to be not going to be useful. Yep. Um. So two things that I wanted to to uh, to to quickly mention. One is so here are the two outputs from um from the LDOs, so HV out and LV out. These ones are the ones that you're going to be using for um you're powering powering your load. Uh, so for example, if you can if I got this one server by Pico, I will use this HV um HV pin and connect it directly to the 3.3 volt um input of Raspberry Pico and I'm done. So basically two connections, the solar panel and this and I'm done. The other thing um that I think is super interesting about um about this particular I see is that it has a status pin, uh, which is status one, that basically, so the, the, the chip internally will calculate how much time you have left 
um, with things as they are, right? With the battery or capacitor as, as it is, and the panel uh, extracting the, the the power that is extracting at, at that very moment in time, it kind of calculates how much time you have left. And if you have more than six hundred, less than six hundred milliseconds left of power, it will send the signal through this pin, um, and basically. You can use that if you connect this pin to your Raspberry Pi Pico or whatever, or any microcontroller, and basically tell it to shut down, right? Or for example, uh, and the way I've used this in the past is I use basically this, um, if it's a very a similar a circuit, very similar to this, to power, um, to monitor another circuit that had uh, power. So as soon as that loses power, this circuit will leave. For, for a bunch of time. And when it has less than 600 milliseconds, it will tell the microcontroller and the microcontroller will send a signal through Wi-Fi saying, um, this device is gonna be shut down because it has no more energy. So at, at any stage, when you were seeing what happened with the device, you could see if the device wasn't working because it wasn't working from some sort of like software problem or because it had no more power. Um, so it can be used for, for two reasons. One is to do a proper shutdown to avoid um, data corruption, which is super handy, uh, particularly in flash memories. And the other one is um, to signal to someone else, hey, this device is shutting down. Um, you might need to take action. I've got, a, I've got another question is, are the voltage outputs for HV and LV, are they fixed? So HV, can be from, I think, 1.8 to 4. I have that in the data sheet. Um, 1.8 to 8, uh, 4 point something volts. Um, and the other one is fixed. Oh, no, like there are two, uh, there are two variables. Uh, 1.2 to 1.8 for LV and 1.8 to 4.1 for HV. Okay, thank you. Um, and those things are um, configured through, um, uh, things on the feedback. Uh, so FBHV and FBLV, that's how you configure. Um, okay, yeah. The, the output voltage. Yeah, voltage divider feedback, got mm -hmm. it. Correct. Um, and then just, I'm gonna go around quickly. So you have, in this case, you have the, so you have two converters. You have a boost converter and a back converter. So if you remember, I told you that the panel that we were using has only two volts output maximum and our, um, our circuit needs at least 3.3 .3 volts. So the very first stage takes those two volts and raises it up to the, uh, the voltage of the, uh, of the battery. In this case, um, the supercapacitors can go up to 4.7 volts. So, we want to use the full range of the supercapacitor. So the chip raises the voltage from the two volts of the solar panel to the 4.7 maximum of the supercapacitor to charge it completely. And then when our device is using energy from the supercapacitor, it has the back converter that converts that down to, I think is for uh, like 3 point something volts. And then you have the LDO that basically uh, smooth is that uh, that output, and uh, that's what you get. So basically, this this chip is designed to again extract the most out of the system. So um, all the energy from the solar panel to charge fully the supercapacitor, and then to discharge it fully all the way down um, to extract the most energy out of it. Um, so you also have status. Uh, pins for um, when the thing is when the MPPT is sampling and one other one that I don't remember. Um, this is just basically fixed, um, provided by the manufacturer and how you have to decouple the decouple and filter the uh, the converters. Um, and then you can set like some of the over discharge and overcharge, uh, but that's a little bit more uh, more advanced stuff. Again, if someone is interested. Um, I can cover that. Um, and this device, this circuit is basically um, uh, 
um, public, so anybody can just grab this and put it in their own uh, by pico if you want. Just find it in the library like this, with this name and just drag in your design. Um, it's fully implemented. Um, it has the two um, the two supercapacitors um, already mounted. Um, it also has test points uh, that you can use to connect this to your own um, to your own board. So this is basically ready to uh, ready to be used. Um, so that is basically what I had to cover. Um, and like now, I hope you understand a bit more how you can properly size your panel, why do you need a PPT, how those panels work, um, and if you need to convert that and use it to your uh, into your board, how that's done, um, and all the stages that you might need, depending on um, the energy source that, that you're using and the battery that you're using. So I don't know if we have any questions that some people drop in the chat. Yeah, we have one that Catherine just posted, which is how sensitive are supercapacitors to heat? Um, they're they're not. So it depends on what you mean by sensitive. So the, they're sensitive in the sense that so supercapacitors that kind of like one of the negative points that they have is that they self discharge quickly. Um, so a battery can hold its charge for a long time. Supercapacitors cannot hold the charge for, for as long. And when the heat increases, that self-discharge uh, current gets higher. So the capacitor discharges on its own faster when it's hot. Um, but on the other side, uh, panels um, do tend to behave better when I mean, not when, when it's hot, but when, usually when it's hot, there's sun. So you're going to have more energy um, that way. But yeah, I, I, unless it gets super hot. When it gets super hot, then yeah, supercapacitor can uh, can be a problem. But so 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 are batteries. When it gets too hot uh, or when you get some sort of problem, batteries can catch on fire and explode. Uh, supercapacitors don't. So there's a balance there as well. we have a suggestion for a perpetual energy machine. <laughs> I know it's a joke, but uh, I also would like one of those and I wouldn't have to pay my power bill anymore. Yep, like sign, sign, me, sign me up uh, if someone has one. <laughs> I'd love, uh, um, love to see it. And we have a little bit of a question about power starvation. I think that you addressed that as part of your initial design where you're trying to size the power envelope of the solar panels appropriately so that you don't run out of, of power. Um, and then, of course, uh, sizing the battery system appropriately so you can at least last through the night when there's no power coming in. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, so, and that, that kind of depends on the use case as well. Um, so if you need to last through the whole night, um, you're going to need a battery that can provide that current um during the whole night that's kind of easier to to, to um to size because you basically like depending on the current that you extract uh you have the milliamps uh the amps hour that your circuit requires and you measure that against the milliamp hours that the battery can provide and um you basically got 